Executive Summary When associated with rising factional discord, the increased hostility from the left resonates a violence that is becoming a clear and present danger. This paper will provide an estimate of the current situation that transcends well-traveled two-party political narratives. The objective is to provide a strategic understanding of the left that baselines the current situation to enable directionality, predictability, and actionability. To that end, the estimate will use a political warfare analysis to reframe the political environment in order to provide timely, anticipatory situational awareness in support of decision-making. National policy has come under the influence of constructed narratives that mainstream and conservative leaders neither understand nor control. Lacking situational awareness to recognize the operational nature of information campaigns directed against national policy, responses tend to be tactically limited and predictably reactive along scripted action-reaction cycles built into the operational sequencing of information campaigns controlled by the left. These powerful but misunderstood narratives drive policy. At their core, these narratives are not American. Rather, they are dialectically driven neo-Marxist memes that infuse mass line efforts operating at the cultural level intent on powering down into the political space. This furthers the left's political warfare effort to impose conformance resulting in the non-enforcement of laws by those tasked with their oversight and enforcement. As these narratives transition into prevailing cultural memes, non-enforcement becomes institutionalized and enforced by an opposition that increasingly comes under the control of those narratives. As such, for the left, political organizations like Congress become vehicles to execute lines of effort in an execution matrix along which information campaigns are executed from outside and above. Key Findings and Observations The political rhetoric driving American politics runs along well-trodden paths, sustaining a political framework from a bygone era incapable of coming to terms with the political movements threatening our constitutional system today. Constrained by this archaic rhetoric, mainstream and conservative players are outmaneuvered in an information battle space they hardly perceive, responding to current threats in under-inclusive manners. The otherism strategy developed by Marxists to destroy America focuses on the systematic destruction of identity leading to the systematic disenfranchisement of Americans from America. It manipulates the issues of the other, yet it has nothing to do with the other. Rather, it forces a classic dialectical negation along Hegelian lines. This activity presents a clear and present danger that will succeed if not countered. As such, this analysis does not suggest that this is a way to understand the left. It argues that it is the only way to understand it, recognizing that it is one, Marxist, and two, dialectically driven. The dominant cultural narratives of our time can best be summarized by the saying, political correctness is the enforcement mechanism of the multicultural narrative that implements neo-Marxist objectives. It is through these narratives that the left drives policy. Narratives that conservative leaders neither control nor understand drive national policy. When Republican leaders shrink from constitutional principles for fear of being accused of racism, sexism, homophobia, etc., they are subordinating those principles to neo-Marxist narratives designed for that purpose. Though these narratives may have been initially imposed, Republicans will adopt them over time through usage. Subjective awareness of the role one plays in such a process is neither necessary nor required. By submitting to these narratives, establishment Republicans first become pliant and then obedient to the left, accommodating it through words that work, that create the illusion of opposition, while actually signaling surrender in the information battle space. In that role, regardless of the mandates that got them elected, 
establishment Republicans will defend the issues that got them elected in deliberately under-inclusive manners that conditions those issues for dialectical negation while demoralizing their base. What Republicans demoralize, the left then disenfranchises. In this role, establishment Republicans become the defeat mechanism of the left. A strategic understanding of the left recognizes that it is dialectically driven. As such, the left is a teleologically informed movement that executes through history and thought, along an arc, with a trajectory. It is Hegelian. It defines everything that is as fuel for becoming in a dialectical process that compels it to negate. Change. Perpetual revolution. Analysis of the left that does not account for the dialectic will fail. The critical theory of the Frankfurt School is classical Marxism dedicated to penetration and subversion that relies on Hegelian processes to achieve its objectives. 1. It seeks the destruction of Western culture. 2. It is focused on an off Habender culture strategy based on otherisms and is nothing more than the targeted application of the dialectical principle of negation to a people. 3. It is fully integrated into larger political warfare efforts. Frankfurt School leader Herbert Marcuse concurred with the Gramsci Marxist plan to adopt a long march through the institution strategy based on Mao's long march political warfare strategy. Political warfare is a Maoist insurgency concept that recognizes the role narratives play in overwhelming rule of law societies. It includes the formation of mass line movements and counter state activities. It also uses cultural level narratives to power down into the political space, where fidelity to the narrative will result in non enforcement of law that, over time, becomes institutionalized. In mass line strategies, political engagements meet the people where they are. Through gentle nudges over time, passive participants become active. At first, a target may only be asked to sign a petition or provide an email or mailing address. From that point, the subject becomes the recipient of sustained communications related to the issues of the originating petition. While an individual may not be politically active, that person, through the supporting consumption of mass market media, will become more susceptible to activist messaging and discontent. The overarching goal of this line of effort is the development and reinforcement of a mass line as it builds the counter-state within the state, complete with its own bundle of replacement legal, cultural, and social norms that operate in parallel with that of the host cultures. The reason America's current toolbox of responses is perilous is because it accepts mass line concepts of America as the terms of engagement. When for example, mainstream Americans are manipulated into responding to mass line narratives from within those narratives. A dialectical paradox sets in where the highly ideological thrust of the left's ambitions are made to sound normal, while mainstream defenses of America sound shrill, rigid, and even ideological. The left focuses on cultural and institutional power by communicating its ideological initiatives in terms of values while targeting the placement of cadre throughout the mass line so they can enable those values by converting them first to norms, then to policy, and finally to law. What is popularly called fake news and the deep state are better understood as propaganda and the counterstate. Transitioning to a political warfare analysis, one begins to discern methods, processes, and directionality that terms like fake news and deep state do not capture. By their nature, media terms like fake news and deep state ensure that analysis remains fixed on the surface of events. Our national aversion to recognizing threats beyond the strictly military, especially ideological threats in the political warfare arena, has long been recognized by America's foes as an exploitable strategic level vulnerability. The left uses dialectically determined political warfare concepts to drive a core set of narratives 
that interoperate at the tactical level while integrating at the strategic. Narratives are associated with the pseudo-realities, or second realities, they seek to establish and enforce. They are called narratives because they are stories, fictions, that seek to supplant the real with the unreal. These narratives are directional, they have velocity, and are always oriented on a target. Saying that the left moves dialectically through time, on a trajectory, simply recognizes that the left is a movement in history, defined by its movement through history, that its backward trajectory defines its forward movement, and that failure to recognize this arc leads to error. It is for this reason that this assessment emphasizes historical events, conditions and movements that have defined the left from the Hegelian dialectic, to Marx, to Wilson's progressivism, to the early Frankfurt School, to Mao's long march, to Marcuse's thoughts on tolerance, to political correctness. This is how the left should be understood. Hence, it would be a mistake to treat the historical elements of this assessment as little more than background material. Assessing the left as if Hegel and Marx simply provide interesting historical context to today's events is the failure to recognize that, for the left, Marx was yesterday and Hegel the day before. Between the two, they are the source code of today's left. To emphasize this point, a recent Daily Caller article is included as Appendix E to demonstrate just how relevant historical awareness of the left is to understanding today's left. Background and Political Climate the United States is engaged in an ideological struggle. This paper will identify the left as defined in doctrine and history, followed by an examination of its strategic nature as it executes mass line operations in the United States. The 2016 presidential election created a sharp relief between the competing camps inside the United States. The two traditional political parties, having lost touch with their constituents, saw the rise of outsider candidates. Both the Sanders and Trump campaigns tapped into the sense of disenfranchisement within the voting base that lost trust in its political elites. The Sanders campaign offered America a classic democratic socialist agenda. In contrast, the Donald Trump campaign argued that America had taken a wrong turn over the recent past and campaigned to restore American institutions, along with a sense of national pride. Voter alienation remains powerful in both camps. Defeating a powerful 10-term Democrat in the June 2018 primary, Bernie Sanders' protege Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez directly appealed to the sense of being disenfranchised when saying, quote, This is not an end. This is the beginning. This is the beginning because the message that we sent the world tonight is that it's not okay to put donors before your community, unquote. The same holds true among conservatives. Explaining the defection of elite-thinking never-Trumper conservatives, the American Spectator recognized, quote, Looking back, it now seems self-evident that conservative pundits were preposterously out of touch. It turns out that conservative intellectuals living inside the Acela Corridor and funded exclusively by think tanks and foundations are poor barometers of Republican voter concerns, unquote. Alienation from the political establishment translates to a comparable distrust of an oppressive elite media. As revealed in the June 2018 Axios poll, quote, Overall, a strong majority of Americans, 72%, believe traditional major news sources report news they know to be fake, false, or purposely misleading. Of those, 53% of Democrats and 79% of independents feel that way, unquote. When groundswells reject entrenched political classes and their associated media, status quo assessments from affiliated institutions cannot provide the way ahead. They will certainly not have the confidence of those who repudiated them, not least because their elite assessments are risably irrelevant to the lives of an actual groundswell that is becoming self-aware of its own conclusions, even as it realizes its own isolation. For those claiming the groundswell as their base, Battle lines are forming that will force a choice between the people they claim to lead and their cloying need for acceptance from an establishment already in repudiation. At this point, Sanders and Trump dramatically diverge. 
branding himself a democratic socialist, Sanders left others to explain that democratic socialism is something other than the Marxism that seeks America's destruction. President Trump, on the other hand, believes America should return to its roots, the very ones the left seeks to destroy, telling citizens that it's okay to be American and to be proud of it. Trump succeeded because his rhetoric intuitively rubs against the very attack narratives the left uses to co-opt establishment Republicans. The unanticipated success of his brute force attacks positions him as an existential threat that forces the left into an openly aggressive posture prematurely. Deploying ahead of a proper correlation of forces, alignment suggests an unexpected sense of vulnerability by the left that can be exploited if understood. The left is America's original civilizational jihad. It should not go uncommented that the left and the Islamic movement converge at the fault line candidate Trump exposed that many Americans are rising to defend. It is the fault line that is being defended even as many struggle to articulate why. This is the strategic discriminator that separates Trump in his role as defender of the fault line from establishment Republicans that exposes the one as genuine and the other as foe. The political warfare strategy of the left is dependent upon successful execution and exploitation of narratives that Republicans conform to that Trump, when on mission, intuitively attacks. This makes one a controlled opposition, while the other becomes an existential threat, but not just a threat to the left, but also to those establishment types that make a living operating in the margins, between winning elections on issues that mobilize a base and demoralizing that same base by choosing not to address them. Trump's victory illuminated the fork in the road that yields no middle ground. It did not create it. With political rhetoric escalating to open threats of violence, it is imperative that the left be properly analyzed and scoped. Threats of violence are no longer limited to street thugs like Antifa, but now come from leading Democratic voices, upscale progressive establishments, and even congressional Democratic leadership. The neo-Marxist trajectory of the left, a political warfare template to understanding current events. The trajectory of the Democratic Party is becoming unidirectional, with the Democrats taking the House in the 2018 midterms. A stable of newly elected radical splinters upset the finely tuned narratives the non-violent main actor leadership uses to maintain the patina of moderation, exposing the party's dramatic shift to the left. As the 2020 election cycle begins, the shift to the left resonates the rhetoric moderate candidates feel compelled to adopt to retain their progressive bona fides to a rapidly shrinking, rapidly radicalizing base. For example, at the June 17, 2019 Poor People's Campaign Presidential Forum, candidate Joe Biden said that as president, if the Republicans blocked his efforts, he was up for a, quote, brass knuckle fight, unquote, adding, quote, Let's start a real physical revolution if you're talking about it, unquote. Speaking to a group of Cuban protesters in Miami, after saying, quote, the eyes of the world are on Miami-Dade and on this airport, unquote, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio cried out Che Guevara's famous revolutionary slogan, hasta la victoria siempre, ever onward to victory. Speak Che Guevara, become Che Guevara, because people become what they communicate in narrative-driven movements. This phenomenon warrants close attention. As important, with the election of a radical confrontational cadre in Congress, the entire political warfare apparatus is now embedded in Congress. As the, quote, moderates, unquote, use of violent rhetoric already signals, this will accelerate the Democratic leadership's movement to the openly neo-Marxist left. Serving as a controlled opposition, this will likewise accelerate the Republican leadership's drift to the neo-Marxist left as well. How is that? Same old, same old, except now it will increasingly expose the Republican establishment's increasingly desperate efforts to meet their, quote, moderate, unquote, Democratic peers in a middle that does not exist, thus further isolating themselves from their own base in very public, very unrecoverable, and very ridiculous ways. In line with the narratives scripted for them, establishment Republicans are conditioned to see the nonviolent main actors as moderates with whom to form a cordon against their radical in-party opposition, mirror imaging the role Republican leaders already see themselves playing against their own set of deplorables. Yet, just as the SBLC shares the same vision as Antifa, 
or the Muslim Brotherhood with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, so the democratic leadership shares the same vision as its radical splinters. As such, the struggles between the democratic leadership and its radicalizing splinters should not be understood to be a struggle between moderates and radicals, but rather as an internal leadership struggle for control of a common movement between that movement's nonviolent main actors and its violent splinters that exist for the sole purpose of wrenching a common agenda forward while dragging establishment Republicans in their wake. This explanation may seem contrived. Later in the paper, after key political warfare concepts are developed, readers will be invited to revisit this section. As important as the election cycle develops, readers will likewise be invited to reread this section, applying it as a competing analytical template to the one they are using to explain what they are seeing. Analysis of the left that fails to account for the narrative impact of terms like democratic socialism will fail because they are under-inclusive to the activities and events that these terms bring into play, not least because so few are aware of the hard association of democratic socialism with Marxist-Leninism. At the same time, well-worn terms with American political pedigrees like quote-unquote liberal serve as foils that mask socialist agendas through narratives that limit political analysis to what an anachronistic political lexicon permits. A principal objective of the left is to keep its agenda camouflaged in the old lexicon while escalating radicalized agendas that find cover under politics-as-usual memes. This can sound pretty theoretical until one realizes that Joseph Pieper's philosophical discourse on pseudo-realities expressed what Soviet KGB defector Yuri Bezmenov exposed in the 1980s when warning of Soviet ideological subversion campaigns against the United States, that 1930s and 1940s Communist Party USA member Belladod testified to in the 1953 House Committee on Un-American Activities hearing when explaining that the CPUSA masked its Marxist agenda in language that made it acceptable to Americans. That Communist Party leader Alexander Trachtenberg said included terms like progressive democracy, and liberalism. Examples of just how far to the left has progressed among California Democratic Party leaders is its endorsement of liberal legislators like Sanders' protege Kevin DeLeon over Senator Feinstein. The term liberal hardly captures the neo-Marxist transition that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's Democratic Socialists of America captures. Of course, as with Sanders' own democratic socialism, these party names deliberately hearken to the original Social Democratic Party founded by Lenin. Despite having a powerful historical and ideological pedigree, almost all political discussions of the left in today's political climate are silent on its defining characteristics, as if the left were little more than a rhetorical straw man. Hence, the question, what does this paper mean when discussing the left? The answer is informed by Bella Dodd's admonition to the House Committee on Un-American Activities back in the 1950s, made no less relevant with the passage of time. Quote, The American people have got to stop fooling around with just fighting communism in the abstract. They have got to know what the thing means, why they are against it, and how to fight it. Unquote. Our national aversion to recognizing threats beyond the strictly military especially our aversion to ideological threats in the political warfare arena, has for some time been recognized as a strategic vulnerability by those hostile to America. Our lack of situational awareness of this vulnerability, by itself, constitutes a threat to our national security. Bringing events current from Belladad's time, two Chinese colonels wrote a thesis for the Chinese War College in 1999 stating that America's inability to recognize political warfare threats is so degraded it may have lost the capability to do so. Of course, for China and every other country that recognizes our blindness to this vulnerability, prioritization of effort demands that it focus its primary lines of effort against America's most exploitable vulnerabilities, which is why the Chinese colonels wrote their thesis for the Chinese War College in the first place. From 1999, two years before 9-11, quote, whether it be the intrusion of hackers, a major explosion at the World Trade Center, of a bombing attack by bin Laden, all of these greatly exceed the frequency bandwidths understood by the American military. This is because they have never taken into consideration and have even refused to consider means that are contrary to tradition and to select measures of operation other than military means, unquote. 